Welcome to this video on genetic polymorphism in drug metabolism. This video accompanies a series of videos on this channel on pharmacokinetics and the intention is to try and place pharmacokinetics into a wider context. Now to understand the contents of this current video you need to have seen the videos on this channel on the basics of drug metabolism and transporters and partition coefficient. It is important that you are familiar with the contents of those videos otherwise quite a bit of the current video is unlikely to make sense. I am also assuming that you have some basic knowledge of genetics. You know what a chromosome is, an allele and a mutation, for example. Now, in videos one to six on this channel, we looked at single dose pharmacokinetic parameters. And then we use those parameters to design dose regimens for repeat administration. And in all those videos, we assumed an average or a normal population, whatever average or normal means. There are a number of factors that can alter the pharmacokinetics of a drug. We met two of them previously, age and disease. But apart from that, the two most important factors influencing a drug's pharmacokinetics are genetics, polymorphism, and interactions with other drugs, so-called drug-drug interactions. Now we're going to cover drug-drug interactions in a separate video, and here our focus is on genetics, the genetic polymorphisms. What is genetic polymorphism? Well, to answer that, we're going to go back to 1974. Ah, those were the days. Those were the days when the scientists could experiment on themselves. You can't do that anymore. I better move on quickly. In 1974, scientists were developing a drug called debrizoquine. It's largely no longer in use. One of the scientists developing this drug took debrizoquine as part of the study. Um, his name was Bob Smith. And after a couple of doses, he became very dizzy and his blood pressure uh, plummeted. The other participants suffered no symptoms. The reason why Bob Smith was affected and the others were not, that is a story that lasts several decades. So we're not going to go through that. We'll just, I'll just give you the answer. There is a debrizoquine. And debrizoquine is metabolized by CYP2D6. And it's hydroxylated. If you're not sure what CYP2D6 is, then you've not seen the video on the basics of drug metabolism and membrane transporters, so you, you really should go back and have a look at that. Once a debrizoquine is hydroxylated, that is the precursor of its clearance from plasma. There are other steps in its metabolism, um, but that is the starting point. That's the initiation point when it's hydroxylated by CYP2D6. CYP2D6 is an enzyme, uh, therefore it has a gene, and that gene sits on chromosome 22. To be a little bit more precise, it's 22Q13.1. If you're not sure what that means, then Q says it's the long arm of the chromosome, and 13.1 denotes the, the precise position on that chromosome. You may see that possibly in the literature. So polymorphism is a discontinuous genetic variation and it results in different phenotypes. So you, there's the gene on that chromosome but the, the sequence of bases can vary. You will have um, mutations of that gene that then manifest as different phenotypes 
either within the species or a, a population. In respect to drug metabolism, we can classify these variants into three main categories. Normal metabolism, increased metabolism, and reduced metabolism. You will see all sorts of subcategories mentioned. Um, extensive metabolizer, super metabolizer, things like this. Um, these terms are rather badly defined, so we'll just stick to these sort of top level um, categories here. Bob Smith had a variant of CYP2D6 that made him a poor metabolizer. Because he couldn't metabolize the brysoquine very quickly, it built up in his bloodstream, and that's why his blood pressure dropped. So you have normal metabolism, otherwise known as the wild type gene. You have increased metabolism. This is where you have multiple copies of the gene, resulting in the production of more enzyme. And then you have reduced metabolism. It's a mutation of some sort in the base sequence that results in an alteration to the amino acid sequence in the protein, which reduces the enzyme activity. The nomenclature behind these alleles you need to know. The way it's done is you have the SIP enzyme notation followed by a star and a number. Let me show you. Here are the, the most frequent polymorphic variants of SIP2D6. And you can see them as SIP2D6 star 2, star 3, star etc, etc. I'm not going to go through all these, but I'm going to pick three of them out as uh, examples. Uh, first of all is uh, star 2. This is where you have gene duplication. More genes, more proteins. It is an extensive metabolizer. Star 3 is a frame shift mutation. That changes the order of the amino acids in the enzyme. And you have a, a, a lower activity of the SIP. Therefore, you have a poor metabolizer. Probably the most um, extensive here is star 5 where you have a deletion of 11,500 bases from the gene, and that actually results in the enzyme being absent in the liver. There's no enzyme. So uh, this isn't so much a poor metabolizer as a no metabolizer. Now, these alleles aren't sort of evenly spread through all humans. They, uh, they occur at different frequencies in different populations. I have just listed here uh, CYP2D6 and 2C19 as examples, but as you can see there are some really wide variations in the uh, percentage occurrence in different populations of these genes. I've also given you examples of substrates, some quite important drugs there. Codeine is mentioned and we will come back to codeine a little bit later. Polymorphisms do not exist just in SIPs. They, they're really everywhere. Um, an example of a polymorphism in a, a enzyme involved in conjugation. Uh, there is a UGT that causes Gilbert's syndrome. So UGTs catalyze the glucuronidation of their substrate. Substrates can be exogenous, such as drugs, or endogenous. In this particular case, the endogenous substrate is bilirubin. So with a reduced UGT activity, bilirubin is not removed from the bloodstream um, quite as fast as it would be ideal. So it kind of builds up a bit, and that is Gilbert syndrome. Gilbert syndrome generally is fairly mild, and is relatively easy to manage. The important thing here is that it is formed, its cause is a UGT polymorphism. 
Um, other enzymes, N-acetyl transferase, the, the NAT2 that we mentioned in the video on metabolism and transporters. Um, there is a, an alarmingly large number of Caucasians that have deficiencies in that enzyme. And it's, uh, it's responsible for the clearance of a number of drugs, including certain cardiac drugs. So it's one with a little bit of a red flag on. More recently, polymorphisms have been discovered in membrane transporter proteins. I've listed one there, OATP1B1. And if you don't know what that is, then again, you've got to go and have a look at the video on the basics of drug metabolism and membrane transporters. That's what they are. What are the consequences of genetic polymorphisms? Let's use debrisoquine and CYP2D6 as the example. In video six, we looked at extraction ratio and hepatic clearance. You should know this, but as a reminder, the liver is the main organ of metabolism. And a drug such as debrisoquine is carried in the blood flow to the liver. The blood flow in units of, for example, litres per hour is designated as Q. In the liver, some fraction of debrisoquine is extracted by CYP. 2D6 metabolism. The fraction that's extracted is known as the extraction ratio or E. Let's pop that up there, give myself some room. Clearance is the blood flow Q multiplied by the extraction ratio. Now if we assume that the blood flow doesn't change, then as the extraction ratio drops because of polymorphisms um, in 2D6 that reduce its activity, then clearance will also fall. What are the consequences of that? Well, we looked at this in the video on repeat dosing. So the plasma concentration at steady state equals the maintenance dose rate. So uh, that is the dose that's given repeatedly, such as so many milligrams per hour, for example, divided by the clearance of the drug. So consequently, if the clearance falls and you use the same maintenance dose rate, then the plasma concentration will increase. So if you maintain the, the normal or the average dosing regimen of debrisoquine, and of course you're quite likely to do this because you don't know who are normal metabolizers or poor metabolizers or extensive metabolizers. You don't know that. So you use this average dosing regimen. But if you happen to give it to a poor metabolizer, then the plasma concentration is going to be higher than expected. All right, what does that mean? Well, again, from video seven on repeat dosing, we looked at the therapeutic window. The uh, therapeutic window is between the minimum toxic concentration, the MTC, and the minimum effective concentration, MEC. You want your drug to be above the MEC. If it's below the MEC, it's, you, it's losing its therapeutic potency. If it goes above the MTC, then you start to see unacceptable side effects. So as an example, you take the first dose, which is within the therapeutic window. The second dose for a poor metabolizer, remember, they are struggling to clear that drug from the bloodstream. That goes up and then the third dose in this example exceeds the MTC. And this is what happened to Bob Smith and that's why he became dizzy. 
Now, the converse is also true. You could have an extensive metabolizer, in which case the drug concentration may re remain lower than the MEC, no matter how many doses you take, in which case you get no therapeutic benefit. CYP2D6 is actually responsible for about a quarter of drug metabolism. It's quite a lot of drugs. I'm going to put out one example, and that is codeine. Codeine is an interesting drug because codeine is metabolized by CYP2D6 to morphine. Codeine is actually a prodrug. It's given orally. When it's absorbed, it's metabolized by CYP2D6, it's demethylated, and it forms morphine, which is the active drug. So it's morphine that's the painkiller rather than codeine itself. In CYP2D6 poor metabolizers, codeine is a lot less effective because they can't demethylate it to morphine. So poor metabolizers, I'm afraid codeine is not a particularly good analgesic. Now, the next bit is somewhat um, tangential to the main video, but it's a good place to pick this up. Because the obvious question is, why don't we just give oral morphine directly? Why do we have to use codeine as a pro-drug? You need to have seen the video on partition coefficient. If you haven't seen that, this next bit will make no sense at all. Codeine and morphine. They are both weak bases. They both have a pKa of around 8.2. But there is a difference in their log P. Codeine, because of that methylation, has a higher log P. In the partition coefficient video, you were given that formula showing the relationship between log D and log P. Log D, as a reminder, is essentially log P, but in relation to the pH. It's the level of ionization that you get at different pHs. And here is a plot of log D against pH for codeine. And here is the same plot for morphine. And you can see that the plot for codeine is kind of lifted up a little bit. I put some dotted lines on here just to show you that effect. The sweet spot for absorption, for passive diffusion through the phospholipid bilayer membrane or through the GI tract, is where the log D is, is somewhere between 0 and 3. So you can see in stomach acid, it's, it's much lower. You get very little absorption there. You've got to get into the duodenum where the, where the pH is higher before you get absorption. But because of that methyl group on codeine, it's lifted the, uh, the, the sweet spot, as it, as it were, higher up. So you, codeine is better absorbed than morphine is. Morphine, you get some absorption. It's relatively slow. And it, you tend to need to get it further down in the GI tract where the pH starts to go up significantly. And therefore, you get a delay in its absorption. And if you are taking an analgesic for pain relief, a delay is perhaps not such a good thing. But that is why codeine is used as a pro-drug. And of course, as I said before, if you take the pro-drug codeine and you are a poor CYP2D6 metabolizer, you might not get very much morphine, which is the active drug. So you may have to go to the oral morphine form. Not ideal, but you might not have a lot of choice. When is polymorphism of concern? You can look at this from two perspectives. From the perspective of the genetics, 
if you find that that particular allele is is expressed in a large number across the population, such as the NAT2 polymorphism, then that could be an issue because there's going to be a lot of people that might suffer from this effect. From the perspective of the drug, which is the other way of looking at it, if its clearance is predominantly by one mechanism, which is enzyme or transporter, then that will exhibit that and that enzyme or transporter exhibit significant polymorphic forms, then you might have a problem. If the drug is metabolized by a whole range of different enzymes, if one of them becomes a bit deficient, then uh, it's being cleared by the other enzyme, so the effect is uh, less prevalent. Now, nowadays, when drugs are being developed, the enzymes involved in its metabolism are characterised to a lesser extent transporters. That's kind of a growing area. But you need to know which enzymes are involved in the drug's metabolism. And of course, if you find that uh, a drug is cleared, for example, exclusively by a 2D6, then you might have a bit of a problem bringing that drug to market because you know there are going to be polymorphic effects. But that's not absolute by any means. You have to take the pharmacokinetic profile into consideration and even the therapeutic area, if it's a life-saving drug, you might be a bit more tolerant of certain polymorphisms. Um, if the therapeutic window is very wide, then the polymorphism may result in the drug concentration still remaining within the therapeutic window. If it's very narrow, then you might have a little bit more of a problem. So there are a lot of factors that you have to bring together in order to account for this genetic diversity. So just to sum up, we are all genetically different. Variations in our genetic makeup are reflected in the activity of our drug metabolizing enzymes, actually in all of our enzymes and all our proteins. And also we're beginning to understand that diversity extends to membrane transporters. Now these differences are reflected in the pharmacokinetics of drugs between different patients. Um, you may have two different patients with two completely different pharmacokinetic profiles. And so in some cases, the polymorphic variants, they are sufficiently frequent in a population to cause concern, particularly if the drug is cleared by one particular enzyme. Now, in terms of prescribing, there are usually warnings um, on the on the labels, etc., where you've uh, uh, where you've got to take care. And in some cases, patients are even genotyped before the the, the drug is uh, is administered. Somewhat rare cases, but it can happen. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention, and goodbye.